Welcome to People in Profit. I'm Kate Moody. 2022 was dominated by Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the energy and inflation crises that stemmed from it, and ongoing disruptions to global supply chains. Today, we're looking ahead to 2023 with Ian Bremmer, president and founder of the Eurasia Group, which has just published its annual ranking of the biggest geopolitical and economic risks facing the global community. Now, top of that list is rogue Russia, uh, which continues its attacks on Ukraine. It's followed by maximum Xi Jinping of China, weapons of mass disruption, inflation shockwaves, and Iran rounding out the top five. Ian, thanks so much for joining us on France 24. Uh, it's perhaps no surprise that you've identified Russia as your number one risk for the coming year. Uh, talk us through that a little bit. Well, I mean, maybe for a moment, just tell you, look, you look at those top five and four of them are very similar. Uh, it's aging dictators and tech bros. Uh, and uh, really, it's a whole bunch of individuals that are making uh, very disruptive decisions without expert expertise uh, and without checks and balances on their power. Um, and, and Putin is the most dangerous um, of that group, precisely because as of last February, he made the single biggest misjudgment of any major leader on the global stage. Um, and he, he's paying for it and his country is paying for it. And there's no way out. There's no way back to the status quo ante. I mean, even with the Cuban Missile Crisis, where we were facing Armageddon, both sides had the ability to have cooler heads and then to go back and do business as usual. That's not possible for Russia because the energy has been cut off by Europe. It's not coming back. NATO's expanding. Ukraine's going to have the most capable military in Europe. All of these things are non-starters for Putin, and he can't do anything about it. So what we're seeing in 2023 is a significant likelihood of Russian escalation, particularly asymmetric warfare against NATO itself. Next on your list, uh, a leader who shares a few of those characteristics in that unprecedented power, Xi Jinping. Uh, he claimed that unprecedented third term in charge of China last year. Uh, he then recently backed down on some of those strict COVID restrictions, unleashing a new wave of uncertainty. Could 2023 be something of a turning point for China's place in the world? Uh, I, I don't know if I would go that far because, of course, it is the second largest economy. It's by far the most technologically advanced country in the world after the United States. Those things don't go away. But the uncertainty and the risk that comes from a country that's that powerful, that is ruled in such an opaque and capricious manner by one man who doesn't uh, listen to technocrats and experts around them and has dispensed with most of them as he uh, consolidated power with his third term. We've seen that with the sudden about face in zero COVID. We've also seen that in some of the rules that he's put in place for his own technology sector, taken a trillion dollars off of Chinese market cap. If you're a major corporation from Europe or from the United States with lots of exposure to the Chinese market, that unnerves you. And it will create a level of decoupling that goes beyond uh, the rules and the regulations that, say, the American administration is putting in place right now. Let's skip a bit further down uh, in your list to number four, inflation shockwaves. Uh, that is a major factor in the global recession that we know is looming. How bad is this going to be? Well, I mean, it's certainly not permanent uh, in the sense that we already see some of the higher levels of inflation reducing a bit in the United States and in some of Europe. But it's going to be with us certainly through 2023. And the impact that's going to have, especially for emerging markets, for countries that are highly indebted, they have angry populations, they've suffered through uh, both COVID and now higher prices with the Russia-Ukraine war, um, and they don't have the fiscal space to be able to satisfy those populations in a way that, say, France does or the United States does. That leads to much more significant instability on the ground in those countries and could cause financial crises in many developing countries, many emerging markets around the world in 2023. These things, they happen very slowly, and then they happen all of a sudden. The idea that you could suddenly get massive capital flight from the emerging markets more broadly into safer asset classes looks very real in this environment in 2023. Now, related to that inflation shock and the war in Ukraine, uh, coming in at number six on your list is an energy crunch. It's a particular yeah. issue for European economies. 
How do you see Europe's energy policy changing or adapting? And what place does that leave for the green transition that we've heard so much about? Well, long term, uh, it makes the green transition more effective because, of course, the Europeans are now in a place where they have to do everything. They have to be more efficient. They have to get access to more fossil fuels like uh, LNG from the United States. Germany just got their first direct shipment. Um, but they also have to move more towards investing in post-carbon renewables. All of those things are happening. So 5, 10, 20 years out, Europe's in a better position as a consequence of this significant shock that comes from the Russian invasion. But in the near term, of course, that means that you have countries using more coal. You have, I mean, carbon being emitted from Europe and from the world is going up in that environment. This is, of course, enormously stressful for populations, and it leads to deindustrialization in Europe. That's the biggest problem, is that the input costs in Europe are so high that a lot of major corporations, especially in countries like Germany, are going to take a lot of their manufacturing out of the EU and move it to the Western Hemisphere, move it to Southeast Asia, where it's just cheaper. Um, and that, that's the biggest challenge that comes on the back of that crisis. Can you pinpoint a few of the risks that are looming over the developing world in particular? Well, the energy risk, of course, is a piece of it. Uh, you asked me about Europe, but I mean, when the Europeans are able and willing to spend much higher prices for LNG, what does that mean for the developing countries that don't have that access? The same is, of course, true for food and fertilizer. That's a very serious problem for them. Water risk and water shortages, which is becoming an ongoing systemic problem as opposed to just a short-term crisis that you need to respond to, that hits the developing world much harder. That's particularly true in sub-Saharan Africa and the Middle East. And finally, and perhaps the most important, even though it's not in the top five, it's only in the bottom five, because we don't care as much about these countries, but we should, is human development. What we see happening after 40 years of globalization, taking people out of poverty and creating a global middle class, is now they're actually uh, working in reverse. And more people are being driven into poverty. More people have hunger. More people are losing uh, educational opportunities. And particularly that's true for women. And of course, that's true mostly in the lower income countries. On the back of the pandemic, on the back of supply chain shocks, on the back of the Russia-Ukraine crisis, all of this ends up hitting the developing world the hardest. And of course, they get very angry with the wealthy countries, who we call the donor countries. But in reality, of course, it's the poorest countries that are doing the donating. They're donating their resources, they're donating their labor, and they're not getting very much in return. Now, there were some huge advances in artificial intelligence last year. Uh, you actually used one of those AI programs to help write the title for risk number three, weapons of mass disruption. Is AI an area that needs surveillance? Um, AI is an area that you don't want a small number of individuals to make decisions without any checks and balances and without good inputs. So it's kind of like the China and the Russia risk. Basically, this entire list is dominated by aging dictators and tech bros. And it turns out there's some overlap between those two groups, right? And so when you have these centibillionaires that make individual decisions about the future, not just of national security, but also of how individuals live their lives, how we receive information, how we consume, and it's being driven by artificial intelligence, generative AI, that is that really can act like a human being. In 2023, the Turing test, it will probably be broken by AI bots where you and I will not be able to differentiate whether we are communicating uh, in textual form with a bot or with a human being. Well, those are things that can be used for incredibly disruptive purposes, especially in brittle democracies. And the United States, which used to be the, the greatest exporter of democracy in the world, for good and for bad, and with hypocrisy as well, back in 1989 when the wall came down, today the United States is the leading exporter of tools that destroy democracy. And that's not intentional, but it's a direct byproduct of these business models. And that's a very serious risk to the world in 2023. That's a fair number of warning signs there. Uh, Ian, what good news do you have for us as we start the new year? 
Well, the very fact that the United States and other major democracies are not falling apart, they're much more resilient than people think. In the same way that we worry about a Putin or a Xi Jinping, we worry less about a Trump or a Bolsonaro. Uh, and the reason for that is because uh, there are um, guardrails. Uh, the institutions stop them from doing crazy things, and eventually they get voted out or they term limit out. That's true whether it's a developing democracy like Brazil or whether it's the United States. The European Union is much more robust and resilient. It has stronger defense policies, fiscal policies, energy policies, and health policies in response to all these crises we're talking about. So it certainly is nice that in the context of all of the risks we're discussing, uh, that there's a very strong message of don't panic for those of us worried about our own political institutions. Ian Bremmer, thank you so much for joining us on France 24 today. My pleasure. Yeah, sure. And thank you for watching. Don't forget you can catch this and our previous shows on our website or as a podcast wherever you usually listen. You can also get in touch with your comments and questions on social media. Until next time, thanks for watching.